Welcome to part two of my conversation with Melissa Carney, whose new book, The Two Parent Privilege, is giving the New York Times fits. If you haven't already, you may want to listen to part one to get the lay of the land in her remarkable work. In part one, Carney laid out the facts on the decline of two parent families over the last 40 years, and she revealed that women are choosing not to marry the fathers of their children when the men are not marriageable, typically because they're not building a successful life, and these men are often those who have not graduated from college. In part two of my interview, Carney will explore what can be done to bolster the earnings of non-college educated men. And she begins asking this question, will an improvement in men's incomes be enough to rebuild two-parent households? Let's dive in. We've talked a lot about money. We've talked a lot about earnings, uh, which is, of course, an important topic. But you raise an issue which is very intriguing, and that is that solving the money problem is not enough. There's a norms issue here that we've got to begin to articulate and talk about. What the heck is a norm? (laughs) Yeah, you know what? Let me, can I say two things about this? So the money issue isn't enough in two different senses. The first is that it's a second parent in the household you know, one of the main things they do is serve as a, a, a second potential earner. And so, you know, on a very practical level, we see that households that have two parents have more money. Even if one parent sometimes stays home with the child and doesn't earn in the in the marketplace, they're providing home production, they're providing child care. So those households have more income. Um, but But one thing I say is, even if the government were to provide a stronger safety net or a, a larger tax credit, all these things I'm for, you can't make up for everything a second parent does. I mean, you and I were talking about this, you know, a few minutes ago. Second parent also provides supervision, you know, an extra extra time, like emotional bandwidth. A, a, a government check is never going to make up for that. So it's not just income that one parent households are missing out on. The second piece in the extent that the economics aren't going to be enough, is when it comes to, okay, what do we do about these trends? And so the first thing is, well, you know, I, I, I do think we have to improve the economic position of non-college educated men. To, so they, they become more reliable, consistent financial providers, which makes them, you know, both from their own perspective, more able uh, to commit to a family and also more attractive to their partners. But the reason I say it's not just an economic problem is partly because of a study I did that looked at what happened when there was a frac- localized fracking booms in localities around the country. And this was work with Riley Wilson. Um, and in the, you know, William Julius, spirit of William Julius Wilson here, we, we hypothesized a reverse marriageable men's story, whereas, you know, these localized fracking booms, they were very good for the earnings and employment of non-college educated men. We see that in the data. We then see that that leads to an increase in births, but there was no increase in marriage and there was no reduction in the non-marital birth share. And that stands in contrast to what happened in the 80s, the 70s and 80s, when there was a coal boom and bust in similar communities, coal-producing communities, an increase in the earnings and employment of non-college educated men. But at that time, in the 70s and 80s, you saw an increase in births only to married individuals and an increase in marriage um, and a reduction in the non-marital birth share. And one of the things I take away from this finding and this contrast is that now that we are in a new social paradigm, or the, you know, where the norms that the conventions linking having and raising kids tightly to the institution of marriage have been, have been eroded in many communities, people respond to economics differently. And so even when we see, oh, look, men are, you know, bringing in more money, they're still more employed. Yes, people use that additional income to have more kids, but not necessarily, you know, regardless, let's say, of whether they're married or not. And so to my mind, this underscores the importance of both economics and prevailing social norms. So what do I mean when I say social norms? I mean conventions. Uh, I mean the way we see people organize their lives, the things that are important, people's attitudes. And here, you know, my view on this is 
in a, you know, a lot of this has been very productive and social welfare enhancing to the extent that, you know, women are not stigmatized for finding themselves in a position of being a single mom. Certainly children should not be stigmatized for finding themselves the child of a single mom. Um, Nobody should be made to feel like they have no choice but to stay in an abusive or harmful relationship. But as those norms have relaxed, I think we need to ask the question whether they've been so relaxed that now there's ambivalence about whether kids are being raised in a two-parent setting or not. And to my mind, without an honest uh, sort of you know reflection of how beneficial a two-parent healthy household is for kids. And that takes us right back to your view that significant, significantly, I guess is the big word, significantly improving the economic prospects of uh, men in America who lack a college degree uh, and are struggling to improve their lives uh, becomes crucially important. And the, the heart, a central question in our lives is going to be, how the heck are we going to pull this off? Yeah. Um, so uh, let me not put words in your mouth. Uh, just give me your, uh, your take on where we start in that. Yeah. You know, let me, let me say too on this point, because I do think it's really important to improve the economic position of men on the point about how this interacts with norms. There is a small movement to, you know, run programs, community programs focused on responsible fatherhood. And in some sense, that's, you know, reinforcing a norm. And so what do these look like? They're parenting classes, they're co-parenting classes. These programs, you know, the ones that have been evaluated, the results are a bit disappointing. And when the researchers dig in, you know, a lot of what the descriptive evidence is finding is, yes, these men want to be more engaged fathers. They want to be good co-parents, but then they're dealing with, you know, economic instability, criminal backgrounds, and then all of the struggles that come with that, right? Like mental health challenges, potential substance abuse challenges. So then where do we start in actually trying to solve the root problems of men being unstably employed, having low earnings, which you're talking about? Um, you know, <laughs> here too, we've tried lots of things. And I would say, you know, here's here's where there has been research and funding um, you know, energy training programs for adults are, you know, notoriously difficult to, to, you know, it's hard to find effective ways of retraining, um, adults. I'm pretty bullish about the role of community colleges. Community colleges are all throughout the country. You know, they serve millions of, of young adults and mid career adults or older adults. Um, but community colleges are both, you know, they're, I think they hold out a lot of promise, but many of them are underfunded and constrained. And so I'm pretty bullish on where do we start at local levels. We need to equip community colleges in concert with local business activity to really provide a lot of this career and technical education that will help a lot of these adults find sustaining jobs, you know, family sustaining wage you know, wages, even if they don't have a four-year college degree. So I'm pretty bullish on that. I think there's promising evidence from things like career academies, some sectoral training programs. Um, you know, again, we, you know, we really have to double down on all of these efforts. So that's, that's one place where I'm, where I think we need to be doing, doing a lot more, um, in smart ways, right? That's, that's why this is complicated. It's not just about spending more federal dollars, it's actually about really building up institutions and programs yeah. that improve skills. On this uh, on this podcast, we spent time with David Otter and uh, Danny Roderick and Duran Osamoglu discussing exactly uh, what you're going over and um, your statement that we need to approach this in a smart way. It can be done poorly, but we really need to figure out exactly how to do it well. Uh, it was those were points made over and over and over in those uh, in those discussions. It's interesting for me to see you injecting a new concern into the economic 
discussion, which is single parent families and what's going on, how does that affect the children and the next generation, and drawing on and reflecting a whole discussion that's going on in our in our society and in the economic profession about fundamental issues like the role of the market versus yeah. what is referred to in general as industrial policy, uh, the government playing a role either on the local level or otherwise in fostering a whole host of activities. I don't think we're going to s- sort that out today, but we're going to live with that issue for the rest of our lives. Yeah, but but here's where too, I mean, let's get back early on. You know, you said you're not blaming single moms. I said, of course not. You also find nowhere in my book do I use the term deadbeat dads, right? Because single moms, I think, deserve a lot of empathy, but also these men who are struggling in our society, I we shouldn't be giving up on them either. So so one of the reactions that some people have to the statistics I laid out at the beginning is you know, we don't need to strengthen families or restore two-parent families. What we need to do is give more single moms help. I'm all for giving single moms more help. But I think it's a mistake to just decide that millions of men are going to be on the sidelines of our economic life and family life too. And so in my mind, that's how these, you know, it's another way in which these issues are very tightly bound up together. No, we need to do all these things to invest in the economic malaise that so many men in the U.S. are dealing with, not you know, for their own sake, but also as a way to sort of restore the families in these communities that have been, have been suffering from all of these different um, challenges. I wanted to test one idea with you, which is, uh, I mean, bluntly, uh, our time has been spent so far talking about how important the issue is and how difficult it will be to address it. Um, and I wondered if you would comment on something I, I noticed about the census data on single parent families, which was that um, to me, just pulling it up rapidly, it looked like the percentage of single family, uh, single parent families uh, peaked some years ago. And there has been a slight decline uh, since then. It's still a massive shift, 1970 about 12.5% of the families were single parent. Today, 29.4% um, uh, of families are single parent families. Um, but in 2006, it was at 32.8%. Um, so you can see in that some change. Is that, what, what do I read into that? First of all, am I misreading the census data yeah, so I um it, it depends on like I think that's generally probably correct. I mean, people will come up with slightly different percentages based on definitions. I it does appear to, you know, the biggest decreases in married parent homes really were in the 80s and 90s and then things stabilized and maybe we're on the upswing. I don't see anything that makes me think, "Oh my gosh, it was just a dip down and we are well on our way back up." So I'm not uh sanguine yet. But it is true, and this, you know, in my mind is a good thing, that it doesn't seem to be getting worse. And maybe it's getting a little better. What's interesting about this is that all of the trends would have predicted that single parent households are way down. What do I mean by this? Well, teen childbearing is down over 70% from the mid 90s. If you just, if we were having this conversation in the mid 90s and you told me teen childbearing is about to plummet, Births to all women under the age of 30 is about to fall. The share of moms with a college degree is going to double. I would have predicted, based on those things alone, that the share of kids living in single-parent households would have really decreased a lot. So in some sense, it's really surprising that it hasn't fallen by more, given that moms are older now and they're more educated. And so all of that will push in the direction of this not getting worse right? But fundamentally what's happened is really, this is a story about marriage declining, even though birth rates are falling and moms are delaying more. And so they're older and more educated when they do have kids. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, good. (laughs) So before uh, we sign off, let me just give you an opportunity to raise any concerns or thoughts you had that we simply haven't touched on. 
Well, I guess let's just wrap up where you started. And, and this, you know, just to underscore, I am certainly not saying people just need to make different decisions. And the reason we're in this position is because people are making bad decisions. Let's use the language of economists. People are, you know, making very constrained optimization decisions. And so if people are faced with a situation where they don't feel like, uh, you know, a healthy, productive two-parent relationship is available to them, we're going to see large shares of kids being raised in one-parent households. And what I'm challenging us to do is really try to understand and address the root causes. The other important thing to note that I'm not saying is that, um, you know, in all cases, kids would be better off if the second parent stayed in the house. And so nothing I'm saying, nothing we've discussed should be misconstrued as suggesting that anyone should stay in an abusive or harmful situation. In fact, there are two recent studies in economics showing that in, in situations where a child has a parent who's been criminally convicted, when they're randomly assigned to a judge who has a higher propensity to put people who have committed that crime in prison, it actually appears to be beneficial for the children. And I think that finding underscores the, the point that whether any individual situation would be beneficial from having the second parent depends critically on what the second parent brings to the home, right? And so again, then we really have to think about that. Why is it that millions of, of parents, mostly dads, you know, are not in the home? How many of them are facing really bad situations versus situations that maybe could be improved with some education? So that's, that's the second important caveat. Let me uh, let me le let me leap off at that point and um, ask you to. I, I don't want to conclude this uh, this interview without having touched on two important figures in economics and sociology um, who preceded you in discussing these issues. Um, to, I think it's important to give folks a sense of the excellent work that was going on and that I, I presume influenced you. I'm thinking of William Julius uh, Wilson and uh, Sarah McClanahan. Yes, um, yes. Without me talking about them, what's your take on those two individuals? They, uh, yeah, they are huge intellectual influences on me and the work I've done. Um, Sarah McClanahan, Princeton sociologist, um, sadly she died last year. Uh, she's amazing. She was pathbreaking in this field. She started the Fragile Family Survey, which interviewed low-income unmarried couples at the time of their child's birth. And from that really innovative survey, we've learned so much about these couples intentions by the way many of them are very optimistic at the time of their child's birth they think they're going to stay together but we also know from that data set that she put together that most of them won't and 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 so this data set that she really spearheaded has just given us so uh, many studies but she really put this issue of family structure out there um and also just you know, I will say I took her sociology of poverty class as an undergraduate, um, even though I was an economics major, and 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 we read all her work on the role of family structure. And it was at that same time that I took that class from her that I actually spent a summer working at a welfare to work center. It was part of welfare reform. Um, so that was, you know, at the the moment I was becoming a social scientist, there's no doubt that sort of taking her class and having that lens at the same time that I was working with single moms on welfare really, in some sense, you know, put me down this path of, of studying this issue for the next two and a half decades. William Julius Wilson, also a sociologist, his work you know, really is, is the first to propose this idea about the role of marriageable men, as he calls them. Um, and, you know, one of the chapters in my book is called Marriageable Men or Not. Um, and at the time, and when he was writing in the, in the mid eighties, he proposed this idea of the economic attractiveness of potential marriage partners as an explanation for the emergent difference in family structure between black and white families at the time. Um, you know, now, 
some 40 years later, what I and others are doing is building on his really important observation, but extending it beyond differences between the races and saying also this applies to differences between education groups. Thanks loads for talking to us. It's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much for having me.